Usually when we think of math on the MCAT, we think chemistry and physics. But in this video, we're going to talk about the math that you're going to see in the biology and biochemistry section of the MCAT. We'll focus on Punnett squares and Mendelian basics to answer even the most complex probability questions that will show up in genetics inheritance problems. First, let's go through a couple definitions that we'll be using in this video. Autosomal. This just means chromosomes and genes that are not related in determining sex. For mammals, that means everything except for the X and the Y chromosomes. On the other hand, sex-linked genes refer to genes that are on the sex-determining chromosomes, like X and Y. These will have different inheritance patterns, so it's important to recognize if you're working with autosomal genes or sex-linked genes. Next up, dominant traits. Dominant traits are where if you even have just one copy of that gene, it's going to be displayed in a phenotype. That's in contrast to recessive traits, where we need both copies of the gene in order for it to be expressed as a phenotype. Finally, homozygous versus heterozygous. For a homozygous inheritance, that means you've gotten two copies of the same allele, either dominant or recessive. For heterozygous, you got one of each, one dominant and one recessive allele. All right, now for some inheritance rules. Remember that for mammals, including humans, which is what we're going to focus on in this video, we have two copies of each gene in our DNA. When a mammalian zygote is formed, we get one allele of a gene from the male parent and one from the female parent. But the male and the female parents each have two alleles to choose from, so we can end up with four different combinations. That's why we use Punnett squares, to figure out and view the probabilities of each of those combinations. Good so far? All right, let's now work through some Mendelian math problems, starting with some probability and Mendelian basics. Let's do this one first. Go ahead, try this on your own by pausing the video, and then we'll come back and work through the probabilities together. Okay, so in this situation, they tell us that hemophilia is determined by X-linked or sex-linked gene inheritance. They tell us that a man with normal blood clotting, and remember males have X and Y, so they only have one copy of the X gene, and he has normal blood clotting, so he does not have e hemophilia. And he marries a woman with normal blood clotting whose father was a hemophiliac. So let's do a mini Punnett square for the woman's genotype. So her father had hemophilia. We'll go ahead and write little h for that one. I am inferring that hemophilia is a recessive gene because if her dad had the gene, then it's a guarantee that the daughter, the woman here, had at least one copy of the hemophilia gene. And if it was dominant, that would mean she would also have hemophilia and she would not be normal. I'll show you what I mean here. So let's suppose that her mother was normal. So we'll say big H, big H. And we can see here that if we do the inheritance pattern for the X-linked gene, any daughters that this grandfather would have are going to be heterozygotes. They're going to be carriers, where they'll have one copy of the recessive gene, but won't display the phenotype. And the sons would be normal, right? But we're not worried about that because this is a woman, so we're focused on her pattern. So she's going to be heterozygote. So let's go ahead and draw her genotype here. Again, also known as a carrier. Now, the uh, husband, right, who's marrying this woman is does not have the gene, which we can infer means that he as the homozygous dominant allele. So, so far so good. Let's go ahead and fill out this Punnett square. For daughters, there's a chance that one of the daughters options would be to be homozygous dominant, no chance of having the hemophilia allele, and then the other daughter is heterozygote. For the sons, one of the son probability is that they would be normal because they would get the normal allele from the mother, and the other probability is that they would have hemophilia because they get the hemophilia carrier allele from their mother. Now, in order to do the probability, we have to determine, are we looking at all of the children or just the sons or just the daughters? They're asked if the couple has three sons. So right away, we can eliminate the daughters from our probability calculations. If they let us know gender and we can eliminate the gender from our Punnett square, we'll do so to simplify our probability. So then they're asking us, what is the probability that hemophilia will be transmitted to all three of them? In other words, what is the chance that all three sons ended up getting this genotype? So what is the chance that the oldest son, oldest son would get this genotype? 
50-50, right? So we'll say one half since that is what our uh, probabilities look like on our answer choice. So our oldest son has a one half probability, but we weren't just asked about the oldest, we were asked about all three. So what's the chance that the middle son would have it? Again, it's the same probability. Yep, one half. And then the youngest son, again, one half, right? We have the same probabilities for all three. It does not change between um, multiple children, right? Multiple progeny. So how do we do probability when we have multiple different probabilities between the sons and we want to calculate the overall probability? Well, when the oldest and the middle and the youngest all need to have uh, the gene in order for us to determine this probability, what we do is we multiply. So when it's an and question, the oldest son and the middle and the youngest, you multiply the individual probabilities to get the overall probability. When you multiply fractions, you just multiply the numerator times and multiply the denominators, and we have 1 eighth. So that is our answer here. All right, so the key thing with this question is A, getting rid of the probabilities for the daughters since we know that there's only sons, recognizing that each son has a 50-50 chance of getting the hemophilia allele, and then multiplying those probabilities because we're looking for the chances of all of the sons having hemophilia, not just one or the other. All right, if you have any questions on that practice problem, go ahead and pop them in the comments below. Let's move on to practice question number two. Okay, you know the drill. Go ahead, pause this video, give this question a shot on your own first, and then we'll walk through it together. Okay, so we're gonna have to take this one step by step. This is a multi-generation probability inheritance pattern. We're gonna need to go and figure out all the information they provide us in the question stem first, and then figure out how to do our probabilities. So let's get started here. In a species of fly, green body color is dominant to brown. That means if we have big G, big G, they'll be green. If we have big G, little g, they'll be green. But if we have little g, little g, then the flies will be brown. Two green flies are crossed. That means that they're just giving us the phenotype. It could be either homozygous dominant or heterozygous. And we're crossed and we produce 29 green and eight brown offspring. So by having brown offspring, we actually know what the genotype needed to be for these flies. And the reason why I'll sketch it for you here is because if we had even one homozygous dominant, right, big G, big G, big G, little g, you can do this Punnett square quickly and see that we would only get green phenotypes. So if even one of the parents is homozygous dominant, we're going to have only green offspring in the F1 generation, but we didn't, we had some brown. So if we had two green flies, but we ended up with brown, that means that we had to have had a heterozygote cross. All right, so if you cross two uh, organisms with a dominant phenotype and you get the recessive phenotype, that means we had a heterozygote cross. So let me go ahead and draw that heterozygote cross here. All right, we're gonna have big G, little g, Right, and so these guys are going to be homozygous dominant. We'll have two heterozygotes, and then we'll have one homozygous recessive. So this is always the pattern with the heterozygote cross is a one to two to one ratio, homozygous dominant to heterozygote to homozygous recessive. So we know right away that this is the progeny. So that's the F1 generation, right? These are the parent generations. So now they're saying, okay, now we take two more green F1 flies, all right? So we're gonna take our options here, are these three guys, right? We're gonna take from only the green flies and cross, and then they ask, what is the probability that both green and red flies appear in that next generation? So to reword that, what they're really asking is, what is the probability that we'll have another heterozygote cross, right? That we pick both the male and the female being heterozygotes. So here's how we do the probability. It's gonna take a couple different probabilities to make this happen. The first is that we know we're only taking green flies. So we do not count the brown fly in our probability. So what is the probability that the male fly is heterozygote? Well, out of our green fly options, that's two out of three. Now, what's the probability that the female is heterozygote? Well, that probability is two out of three. We need both the male 
and the female to be heterozygote in order to get brown flies, right? The same rule as before. So therefore, it needs to be an and, which means we need to multiply this probability. Again, it's two out of three, not two out of four, because we're not including the brown flies. We took only green flies, so we can ignore the brown flies because they're not part of our probability. So multiplying across, two times two is four, three times three is nine, we have a four-ninths probability. All right, so again, I hope you're seeing the theme. First off, see if you can eliminate any genotypes from the probability because of the phenotype we're choosing from, and then making sure that you're multiplying if we need both situations or all situations to be true in order to get our final probability. All right, if you have any questions on the fly problem, go ahead and put them in the comments below. All right, our final practice problem is gonna be on dye hybrid crosses where we have multiple genes going on at once. Before we get into that, I'm Amanda Brem, and I've been coaching students on their MCAT journeys since 2019. Please make sure to subscribe to this channel for more videos on MCAT content, test-taking strategies, and mental fitness tips to help you perform your best on test day. And if you'd like more in-depth interactive lessons on topics like this one that also include active practice and test day strategies, please check out the link in the caption below, which will take you to register for my next available MCAT course. All right, go ahead and give this challenging question a try first, and then we'll walk through it together. So we are told that in cats, suppose that in cats, short hair is dominant to long hair, and amber eyes are dominant to green eyes, right? And so we have two different genes going on. A female cat that is heterozygous for both traits is mated with a male cat that is also heterozygous. So we have a double heterozygote cross. Both of the H and A traits assort independently for each other. This is just a phrase that they have to say, that they sort, assort independently so that we can do this Punnett square. If they did not assort independently, we would not be able to do this probability. Then they ask, what is the probability that they will have an offspring that has long hair and amber eyes? So here's the deal. In order to do a dihybrid cross, we can't do the Punnett square separately because the probabilities may not work out separately. We actually have to combine the different alleles in the way that they would be combined in a zygote. So we have a female cat that's heterozygous, so she's going to be HHAA, and crossed with a male cat that's heterozygote, HHAA. And what we're looking for, you always want to figure out what you're looking for first, is long hair. So that means they need to have little h, little h, and amber eyes. So they just need to have at least one dominant A allele. All right, so this is what we're looking for in our progeny. Now, again, we have to do what's called a dihybrid cross, which is going to be a 16-cell Punnett square. So I'm going to draw it out for you here, just as if I was doing this on test day. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, so we'll put the female options across the top. They're going to be the same for both female and male in this cross. So what do we do? We have to show that all the possible combinations of alleles in each gamete. So remember, we have one of each, so option one would be dominant H, dominant A, right, for the female. Option two would be dominant H, lowercase a. Option three would be lowercase h, dominant A. And the final option would be lowercase h, lowercase a, little h, little a. All right, so these are the four possible combinations that we'll get from the female gametes. And we're gonna have the same possible combinations from the male gametes because these are autosomal traits. So we'll go ahead and just draw those same traits down the side here. I want you to do this on test day where you draw out the axes and the combinations, but I don't want you to fill in all of these cells. All right, it's gonna take too much time on test day. Instead, now we wanna look for the genotype that we need. We need little h, little h. So that's going to knock out any dominant H's, right? So we can cross out all of these cells because they're gonna include at least one dominant H. So we're only left with four out of 16. So right away, we can eliminate B, which says nine out of 16. Then we need a dominant A. So we do have a dominant A here. We do have a dominant A here. We do have a dominant A here. Oh, but we have little a, little a here. So we do not have a dominant A here. So one, two, three are left. So our answer here is three out of 16. All right, so you don't need to fill in all the cells, but you do need to set up the possible combinations and put the axes together. And then you can quickly go through and eliminate any genotypes that don't fall into our probability that we're looking for.
This one was a little tricky, so if you have any questions on this final practice problem, please go ahead and put them in the comments below. All right, I hope you enjoyed those practice problems on Mendelian math. If this was helpful for you, please share it with your pre-med community. You know that the MCAT is hard and stressful, and sometimes we could all use a little help. Thanks so much, and happy studying.